I had no idea that researching my family's history would take me to Salem, Massachusetts. I'm amazed to discover that my family history got its start in Salem, Massachusetts, of all places, from the bachelor side of the family. Some very interesting characters there. But I'm going to focus on only just one of the family members, and that would be my eighth great grandmother was one of the accused in the Salem witch trials that happened in 1692. During the Salem witch trials, the court relied heavily on spectral evidence and its examinations to prove the case against the accused. Spectral evidence is based on visions that the accusers reporting what they saw or experienced. It was also believed that witches had the ability to shapeshift themselves into such things as animals like black cats, birds, or in Mary's case, a blue boar. Mary Perkins Bradbury. Her ordeal began in May of 1692 when Anne Putnam Jr. named Mary as her tormentor, as did Mary Walcott and Sarah Bibber. Anne was the daughter of Thomas Putnam, also a main character in the Salem Witch Trials, which we will talk more about later. The Carboys, along with Samuel and Zerubbabel Endicott, claimed that a batch of butter that Mary made and she sold to Captain Smith during their voyage to New England some 20 years earlier was voodoo butter and that it made them all ill and they insisted that Mary brought upon them a big storm that caused their ship to lose the main mast along with the rigging and 15 horses went overboard. They further claimed that her spectre also haunted them on a bright moon shining night. It was also reported that Mary caused the death of Richard Carr when she transformed herself into a blue boar, which attacked the father's horse, causing Richard to fall outside her home one Sabbath. Ann Putnam Jr. claimed that John Carr's ghost visited her to testify that Mary indeed killed them. Zerubbabel Endicott came forward to support the accusations that Mary did indeed send her specter to dart at Mr. Carr. Mary was further accused of causing the death of John Carr by dethroning his reason and leaving him weakened by disease with disordered fancies. And these were the accounts that brought a conviction against Mary on September the 9th. She was convicted of witchcraft and sentenced to die to take place on September 22nd. Until then, she was held in a small, cold, dark dungeon awaiting her execution. When I visited Salem, Massachusetts, I, I visited a replica of the dungeons, and those rooms were very small. They, the people were chained to the wall. Sometimes they were their hands were together and chained above their head. Sometimes they were chained at the ankles. There was no light, there was no heat. It was dark and it was cold and I'm sure frightening. There were at least two people, if, if not three, who died while in prison waiting for their sentence or waiting for the trial. My eighth great grandmother, she spent four months in prison. I can't imagine. She was in her 70s and she's sitting in this cold, dark cell knowing that she's been condemned and that she's to hang. And she was convicted being a witch. Sentenced to die. Who really was this Mary Perkins Bradbury? Mary was born in 1615 in Warwickshire, England. She was the daughter of Sergeant John Perkins Sr. and Judith Perkins, who arrived in Boston, Massachusetts in 1631. At age 16, 
Mary settled in Ipswich. She met and married Captain Thomas Bradbury of Salisbury. Mary caught the eye of one of the most well-known citizens of Salisbury, Thomas Bradbury, and this moved her up in colonial American society. Mary and Thomas were prominent pillars of the community. Thomas was a man of prominence in the colony who came from a landed family. His mother, Elizabeth Whitgiff, was the niece of John Whitgiff, the Archbishop of Canterbury under Elizabeth I. Thomas was the land agent Sir Fernando Hoge, a relative who controlled much of what is today York County, Maine. Thomas was the deputy to the general court for seven years. Thomas' marriage to Mary Perkins gave him more clout because Mary's father, John Perkins, was a powerfully connected man. John and his wife, Judith Gator Perkins, arrived in New England in 1631 on the ship Lion from Bristol, England. They settled in Ipswich, Massachusetts by 1634, and he represented Ipswich at the general court. The river that runs to Ipswich it's called Ipswich River, so Ipswich is up that direction, and that would be where Thomas and Mary started their family. Thomas and Mary were religious people who regularly attended church. They raised 11 children. The Reverend James Allen testified that Mary did many works of charity to the sick and poor. Mary ran a successful butter business out of the home, and Thomas was a schoolmaster, associate judge, and captain of a military company. Thomas was described as one of the ablest men in Massachusetts during his life. How did this sweet old lady, who is a church-going lady from a prominent family, how did she get caught up into this frenzy witch hunt? We are going to explore the answer to that question. Back in 1692, a dark cloud fell on Salem, Massachusetts. A witch hunt began with the intent to wipe out the dark forces of Satan's power by a small, deeply religious Puritan community. The Puritans lived in a very tight covenant communal relationship with each other and they were very suspicious of any outsiders or those who had different beliefs. Everyone was expected to abide by the same rules, and anyone who deviated from their rules became suspect of doing Satan's work. If you have seen the movie The Village, it will give you a picture of how these Puritan believers lived. They lived clean, wholesome lives, believing that they were doing God's work. The most devout of them believed they had reached sainthood, as in they were better than other people who are not Puritans. They felt they were special, which is dangerous thinking, because any time man thinks himself to be better than others, they will destroy others one way or another. That's part of the problem with religion. Religion is one of Satan's greatest tools. Beginning in the month of March and April of 1692 in Massachusetts, running all the way into fall of that fateful year, if a woman had knowledge of the use of herbs and plants for medicinal practices, she was suspect of being a practicing witch. If a midwife had a child die under her care, she might be accused of witchcraft. Or if a woman didn't attend church regular, or worked in a pub, or dressed differently than the manner in which the Puritans were expected to dress, she might become suspect of being a witch. Oftentimes, widows and elderly ladies became suspect for one reason or another. More importantly, if you did not keep to the Puritan's way, you were outside of God's domain. Or, as you will see later, if you owed any money to another 
or had property that your neighbors wanted. You might get accused of being a witch so they can take your property. It seems as if any reason could bring a charge of witchcraft. But as the tensions grew, even more prominent and wealthy people were accused of being witches. The accusation and conviction of Mary Perkins Bradbury, the wife of one of the leaders of the colony, was a clear sign that Salem witch trials had grown into a frenzied witch hunt bred on hysteria. You have to ask the question, if these people coming to the new land were deeply religious people, why would they think witches were among them? How did this come about? I actually combined information from several different maps to create this map. Boyer and Nisbaum mapped out the residences of those involved and found that a majority of the accusers came from the western half of the village, which was the more rural side, while a majority of the accused, as well as those who spoke in defense of them at the trials, lived on the eastern half of the village closer to Salem Town. About five miles north of Salem was an area that was first known as Salem Farms. That's this area right here marked off in green. Salem Town is over here. This is the town of Salem. This is usually where people go when they want to revisit the trials of Salem, Massachusetts. But guess what? Most of the events took place here in Salem Village. A is for accusers, D for defenders, and W for the accused witches. Quite interesting. You see that most of the accusers come from the, the western side. A lot of the accused uh, witches, the ones that were accused witches, are on this side. There's some here, there, there, here, here, and down here. There's a couple over here, but for the most, and there's some right here. But for the most part, they are this side. Salem, as a town, was very divided. Politically, spiritually, economically. There was just a lot of things taking place during the Salem witch trials. And I have spent many hours, actually several months, <laughs> looking into it because it's a fascinating uh, time in history. What was the current religious and political climate prior to and during 1692 in Salem? There were something like 200 accusations made during this time frame. How then could this happen? We have to look at the events and the people surrounding this event to begin to understand what led up to the infamous Salem witch trials. The creators of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, chartered by the motherland England, controlled by the Crown of England, dictated how the pilgrims and the new settlers in this new world were to live. When they established a new colony, they would always designate a space, usually called the green, or the center of the colony, and they put up a church, and they hired a magistrate to minister to the people. They were very careful not to allow any preacher who would preach against any of their doctrines or beliefs. Some of their doctrines were not even based on the Bible, but were man's inventions. Any preacher who did not toe the line, as dictated by the Crown or Massachusetts Bay Colony, they were not permitted to preach. There was one such preacher in my ancestry on my father's side of the family who was such a man, but I'll save that story for another time. The Puritans not completely agree with the Church of England, so in the New World, they would make their religious practices better. They thought to purify the church, thus comes their name, Puritans. You've probably heard of separatists coming to early America as well as Quakers. The separatists wanted to completely break from the Church of England. That is why they are called separatists. The Puritans thought to set up a theocracy type of government 
They would make people go to church, even command it. It was the law. If you lived during colonial America in the Massachusetts Bay Area, you'd be forced to pay taxes to the church if you lived within a five mile radius of it, even if you were not a churchgoer. If not, you could be beaten. Yes, they did that in those days. The Massachusetts Bay Colony has a very dark history all its own on that score, which is why many left Massachusetts and moved to Rhode Island, Connecticut, and Maine to start afresh. With all these new ideas and varying belief systems, it's no wonder they were disagreements and divisions among the early American settlers, which eventually led to the reason for the American Revolutionary War. The very thing that Crown and the Massachusetts Bay Colony feared would come of these rabble-rousing preachers outside of their control. When the colonists arrived in the Massachusetts Bay Colony and Salem, they soon found that the land in the immediate vicinity was not fertile and many moved outside of the city and numerous small farming communities popped up. Jonathan Putnam, General Israel Putnam was born here. This is Putnam Hill and that's Thomas Putnam. The Putnam family controlled much of the land. Later that area would be called Salem Village. Today it is known as Danvers. I've made these little characters. I'm going to use this as a representation of Governor um, William Phipps. He was the governor of Massachusetts. He envisioned that the Massachusetts Bay Colony would be a city on a shining hill to set the example for the rest of the country to follow. Sir William Fitz was a devout Puritan and he believed in the Puritan communal ideas. The Puritans moved into Massachusetts Bay in 1629 to become the perfect colony. They had escaped England from persecution, but their beliefs and laws were intolerable. Their lifestyles were very restrained. They were expected to work hard and repress their emotions and opinions. I'm not sure they were good at that. Also, they believed that the devil was as real as God, and that's true. But the devil would go for the weak ones, which were women, children, and the insane. Those who follow the devil were considered witches, which was the most sinful law in the Puritan mind, punishable by death. Sir William Phipps set up the court of Oyer and Terminer to reside over the Salem witch trials. On this map, I've included um, important locations of where certain events happened or certain people that were involved in the Salem witch trials. And so they are denoted, um, like for example, this is Jonathan Corwin. He, A, would be from Brookdale. Why did I go through so much trouble creating this giant map? This is my family history. I mean, my name is, my maiden name is right there on the map. And much of my family started in Salem, Massachusetts. What did Mary do that caused her to be suspect? What did she do that convicted the court to make, to convince them that she was a practicing witch. Let's look at those charges. A Boston merchant named Robert Califf, who denounced the Salem witch trials of 1692, wrote this. And now, 19 persons having been hanged and one pressed to death, eight more condemned, in all 20 and eight, of which above a third were members of some other churches of New England and more than half of them of good conversation in general, and not one cleared, about 50 having confessed themselves to be witches, of which not one executed, above 150 in prison, and 200 more accused. The special commissioner of Oyer and Terminer comes to a period. The witch hunt went on far too long. Only when Governor William Phipps' wife was accused did he finally take a stand against any further imprisonments and forbade any more executions for witchcraft in Salem. Because of the governor's actions, 
the nearly 150 men and women who were still chained to prison walls were set free. Who were the principal players in the famous Salem witch trials? And did they have something to gain? So let's take a closer look at the people surrounding and involved in the events of Salem, Massachusetts witch trials. Mary Bradbury became an old lady. She's uh, in her 70s. Some say she was 72. Some say she was 75. I'm not exactly sure, but she was in her 70s. Let's look at some of the people that were involved in the trials. The judges, John Hawthorne, the main, the chief judge, Mr. Paris. He's the preacher of Salem Village at the time. He was very involved and I think more needs to be looked into him. And there's also Cotton Mather. He wrote a book that had a lot of influence on this, this trial, but he was also against the use of spectral evidence. And people say that he's not at fault for what happened, but his book seemed to have some effect on the people's beliefs. And then there was the Putnam family, Thomas Putnam. I'm going to use this guy as an example of um, the man. I kind of made him small. <laughs> I made him small on purpose. But he was a very prominent person in this whole thing. And it appears that he had a very close relationship with the judge. He wrote letters to the judge. Putnam, let's just look at the Putnam family. Let me move the officials out of the way here. Let's just look at the Putnam family. But his daughter, 12 year old, Anne. So we have Thomas Putnam. We have Anne, Anne, Anne Senior, Anne Junior. This family had a huge part in the accusations. Thomas Putnam, he recorded a lot of the documents that are in the trial. So this family, this from the Putnam family, were very much involved and the preacher. These were the some of the main people involved, but of course you, you cannot cannot leave out um, John Hawthorne, or is it Hathorne? His his grandson uh, changed his name to Hawthorne, but also the Puritans and the way that they thought themselves to be higher up. And the girls were influenced by everything. They were between the ages of 12 and 17. They had so much power during the trials because they were allowed to, to use spectral evidence and these girls were, the, were accusers. Anne was the main accuser, supported by her dad. Another strange thing about this whole thing is that nearly everybody that was accused were enemies of Mr. Thomas Putnam. So I find that very interesting. Just, just astonishing that nobody questioned him. Nobody questioned his motives. And I think there's a, there's a story there about why. Why was he so involved in, and, and what was his relationship with the chief questioner, the chief judge, and, and this preacher? Did he have something to gain from all of this? What was the nature of the relationship that Putnam had with these two men? And I think right there you have a triage of trouble with these three men and their involvement in these trials of innocent people like an old lady. Let's take a closer look at the Carr Bradbury family feud. When did it all start? Here's another family that was involved in this whole ordeal as it pertains to Mary Perkins Bradbury. Of course there's George. He doesn't look very happy, does he? Yeah, he was thwarted in love. She, re she rejected his marriage proposal. So there's that. And that's probably the spark of the family feud between the Carr family and the Bradburys because she rejected him. But not only that, Mary's daughter rejected a marriage proposal and so he's not happy either. And the Carr boys gave test testimony during the Mary's trial. There was one Carr member 
who was different than the rest. And he actually uh, defended Mary in court, the only sane member of the family, of this disgruntled family that, I don't know, it almost seems like they had a conspiracy of their own. How can we do something to Miss Bradbury? Because the Bradburys are snobs, it seems. I'm just, just based on what I've read about all the events. So on the western side of the village, you have mostly farmers. And then closer to the city, or in the city of Salem, you have merchants. They were becoming more and more prosperous. Salem is a port city in its early days was one of the important ports for trade which the townspeople established their merchant businesses on. And so we, we see the geography and the, the economic differences between the two groups of people was part of the divide that happened in Salem as more people moved into the area. The colony was growing. Salem was divided into two parts, Salem Town and Salem Village. The townspeople had established their merchant businesses. It was an important port for trade. Salem Village was more inland and where the majority of the people were farmers by trade. As the population of Salem grew, with more people settling the area, the disparities between the townspeople and the villagers also grew. As Salem Town grew, the villagers fought to have their own church nearer to them. Here's the church in Salem town. Mr. Putnam, he lives right there. The Putnam family, who were from the beginning rich landowners on the western side of Salem, pushed for the effort to establish their own church in the village, which they did eventually get. And that church was right there on the old Meeting House Road. But there were disagreements about the, this proposal. Some of the villagers still had close connections with the townspeople and they wanted to keep their arrangements. So when the village church was finally established, there were disputes about the preacher, Samuel Paris. And some of them refused to pay their taxes in order to pay the preacher. Well, Thomas Putnam had a great deal of power and influence in this new church. When researching to create this video, I came upon far too much material to put into one video. There are so many intricate parts at play in this whole debacle. So if you're interested in learning more, or interested in American history, or just want to understand more about this particular event, please subscribe and hit the notification bell and leave me a comment or drop a question. In my next installment of this story, we will take a deeper look into the events leading up to the trials which I have only touched the surface of an explanation of each of the accusations and what is really behind them. Examining the most prominent people influencing the Salem witch trials and their possible motivations, plus the conclusion to the story of my eighth great grandmother, Mary Perkins Bradbury, which I have not yet revealed. So sorry, I have to leave you with so many loose ends. But it is what it is.